Did the ancient Egyptians carve the Sphinx to look like a lion, or did the universe tell them it was a lion? Now, I know that sounds like a crazy question, but there's a recently published paper that says that's a possibility. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to the Dunking. Now, the Sphinx is carved from natural bedrock, and as such, it eludes definitive anything. You can't really 100% pin down when it was made, who made it, whether it was originally carved to look like that or not, whether it was covered in casing stones or not. The list just goes on and on and on and on and on. As I'm sure you're well aware, there's plenty of people debating this stuff all of the time. But there's a paper that was published in the Fluid Dynamics Journal Physical Review Fluids, and it adds another hypothesis to the mix, and this one's quite interesting to me. In it, the authors posit that wind erosion shaped the bedrock to look somewhat like a lion and that this inspired the Egyptians to carve it to look the way that it does. Now, the full paper is not available yet, as they just were published a couple of weeks ago, but there is a poster that's mentioned in the abstract, and that poster is available and provides a pretty good synopsis. There is evidence that the Great Sphinx was a natural landform before its surface features were chiseled by the ancient Egyptians. Is this controversial theory plausible? We carried out experiments on the fluid mechanical erosion of clay. Based on accounts of the non-uniform composition of the Sphinx, we tested the effect of hard inclusions with hillocks on softer clay. The flow of a water tunnel mimics the prevailing winds of Giza and the three-dimensional optical scanning records the history and evolution of the shape as it erodes. A featureless mound transforms into a majestic lion in repose. The cylindrical head is the only inclusion and its wind shadow shields the body. Dye added to the clay helps to visualize the turbulent wake that carves the back of the lion. Releasing dye upstream reveals compressed streak lines under the head, and this accelerated flow digs the neck and reveals the forelimbs and paws. These results show what ancient peoples may have encountered in the deserts of Egypt and why they envisioned a fantastic creature. Now four things stand out to me that require further scrutiny in my opinion, the first being the inclusion of a cylinder for a head. At first glance this kind of seems like a way to fix their findings. Now we do know that that part of the Sphinx is made out of harder rock than the lower parts, so it does kind of make sense, but it does seem like a way to fix their findings. I'll kind of give it a pass, but it, it does seem a little bit on the nose to me. Now the second thing that seemed a little weird when I first read it was that they used a water tunnel instead of a wind tunnel. But fluid dynamics guys, they work with both water and wind, and so I'm assuming that they're just doing this to speed up the erosion process of the clay, so I I'm going to give it a pass for now, but when the paper comes out I would like to see the difference on this. The next thing is a lack of consideration of the fact that the Sphinx is in an enclosure. Um, I don't really see that represented in their modeling there, and you know, it'd be about halfway up of what they're showing there would, would have been like level with the ground, so I don't really see how that would have been eroded the same as what was above the ground. Now, when more info is available, of course I'll cover it, but for now I'm kind of skeptical about this part because if you're not taking all of the other factors into account of the entire environment, if they're just taking the Sphinx and the wind that's supposed to be hitting it, I don't really see how that's going to hold up when all these other factors are accounted for. But this still does offer some interesting ideas. Perhaps the wind erosion created the Egyptian obsession with felines that we see so much. I mean, it's, it's tough to say for sure, but this is kind of an interesting path to go down. It also does kind of tie into the stuff I've spoken before about the Ben Ben stone pot potentially being from the Sphinx, Link stuff. Um, but basically, it's if you know if they had to take some of it off to to sharp to shape it the way they wanted to, if the piece they took off was a piece that was aligning with the sun, it would make sense that that piece would have some symbolic and religious significance. Click the link if you would like to hear more. Plug plug. But the fourth part is the most problematic to me. The three authors that are mentioned are all fluid dynamics guys. They're all mathematicians. Not one of them is a geologist. Now, since the paper is not available, I can't check and see if they consulted any geologists or not. Perhaps they did. But as it is right now, that's the part that I would like really need to know first. If geologists say that the weathering is just like flat out, no, this is not wind erosion. Well, then the rest of their hypothesis is really highly dubious. But if geologists sign off on it, well, that's a pretty good possibility. So... That's the one thing I really would like to see the most out of this paper. Now one more thing worth mentioning is if the wind did indeed shape the bedrock to look like that, it doesn't mean that they had to have shaped it into a lion. It could have been a jackal or a dog or any critter that rests on its haunches, right? Now of course the veil of time makes this really hard to discern and I'm hopeful that my old butt will get to see some more answers on this stuff before I'm getting embalmed and entombed. You know, I really love this sort of mystery where science scratches the surface and gives us a little window to look through. It just tickles my imagination. If it tickles yours too, you're in the right place. Thanks a lot and I hope to see you next time.